on. Uh, we're recording. But one of the first things that I want to do is hand it over to Caroline Ward Holland for uh, for her to acknowledge the land that we are on. Caroline, thank you. Um, the purpose of land acknowledgement is to um, educate and form relationships with our community. Um, if you live in the San Fernando Valley, anywhere or, or surrounding areas, Southern Antelope Valley, Piru, Castaic Junction, Simi Valley, Calabasas and Agora Hills, along the foothills into Los Angeles, then you live in Tataviam country. And our tribe is the Fernandeño Tataviam Band of Mission Indians. And Fernandeño comes from the Spanish who gave us that name, the people that they brought to the missions. They called them Fernandeño. A lot of us live um, possibly even in a village site area. Sea Sun's a village site area. Magic Mountain's a village site area. Tapo, Topanga. So most people don't even know that we're, we are still here. Our ancestors survived the Spanish period, Rancho period, the US period. And we live and thrive in this community. We're nurses and, and teachers and we work at Ralph's and there's a number of um, people that probably you don't even know, your neighbors that are um, Fernandeño Tataviam. We have a tribal office in San Fernando and um, we are economically sound or forming relationships in, in different areas to provide for our tribal people. Um, we are landless and um, we are currently looking for federal recognition from the federal government, but um, we uh, are very, um, vibrant tribe and the, we're still here. So the San Fernando Valley is home um, to our ancestors, which are the Vernon Daniel Tataviam Band of Mission Indians. So and you can find our website um, and find out more about us. We have events, we do a lot of community work and uh, we are <clears throat> uh, very much trying to be a part of the community. We are a part of the community. People just don't know that we're still here. So thank you for allowing me to acknowledge or educate you and let you know about our tribe. Thank you, Caroline, for that and that land acknowledgement. Uh, important to start off this kind of event meeting with that acknowledgement. Again, my name is Onkar Patel. I'm one of the founders of West Valley People's Alliance. Co-hosting with me is Hannah Bowman with the West Valley, uh, House, West Valley Homes yeah, Housing Yes. Hannah, do you want to say welcome? I'll just say hi, welcome to everybody. I'm Hannah Bowman, a co-founder of West Valley Homes Yes. Um, and we are delighted to have you all here for this program. Thank you for joining us. Yes, yes. Thank you again for joining us. Shout out to school board member David Barlavi uh, for joining us and, and all of you wonderful people. Let's um, just jump straight into it, right? Where is the love? And we find the love in the stories from the streets and from our community. One of the first uh, ones that we're going to start with is a testimony from Frankie, who uh, we've been working with. Uh, they've been houseless for three years in Chatsworth. And in this testimony, they're discussing the devastating impact of sweeps. Um, let's share that. I guess I need to also, uh, sorry, let me, <laughs> let me share my screen, sorry. Captain, on what uh, Kim was saying about the demoralization and the awful experience of being swept and what that does to being, you know, to homeless people and, and what mindset that puts them in. You put a person who is struggling day by day to gather water, to wash their hands, wash their face, wash what little dishes or underclothes that they have to maintain a little bit of, like, you know, sanitary saneness you know, to go through the next day so they can go and get more things that they need, like food, like items that they take from us, our, our blankets, our sleeping bags, which in these cold weather that we're now having is not okay. Because when you only have one blanket, you're not going to keep you warm, especially on the concrete ground. When they take your tent, when they take your stoves, that, you know, you, you, we use our stoves not just to heat food, but we use it to heat up the tent so we don't freeze to death. So when you take those things, you take 
everything that we have, you 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 leave us with nothing. We you take the tools. You take our food. When you take our food and our water, which I mean was mandated in every list that they gave us that you weren't allowed to touch our food. They took my food every single time. They took my warm, fluffy clothes that I had to sleep on, sleep in to keep me warm every single time. These things that they left me were was one bag of dirty clothes. One bag of dirty, dirty clothes. And that's what they left me. They took all my cleaning supplies. I don't like being homeless. I didn't like being dirty. I liked having soap. They took all my soap. They took everything I needed to keep my sameness, my my little bit of happiness that I could have throughout each day. They just came and swept it up and threw it in a dumpster and told me, oh, well. It was if I argued and fought with them, they wanted to arrest me. If, if we argued and fought for other people's stuff that they were taking, they would arrest us. That was our threat. We would have cops in our faces pushing us around, literally pushing us away from our belongings. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but if someone came into your home and went through all of your stuff and decided what it is that you were allowed to keep, what you weren't allowed to keep, and just left you with remnants on the ground, how would that make you feel? It would make you feel horrible. So it puts you in this deep depression and it goes week by week by week. You can't walk away from your stuff because you're afraid they're going to come take it again. So how are you supposed to do anything more positive for yourself besides sit there and have people drive by taking pictures of you, posting them all over the internet, making fun of you, humiliating you because you can't even leave your stuff to get out off the street? I didn't want to sit by my tent all day every day. I didn't want to do that. I can't hide in my tent because we had to put it down. Like, do you know how insane that is? You don't want us out there, but we can't leave because you make it so we can't leave. So these sleeps, they need to stop. You're literally, like Kim said, we had a friend who hung himself last month. And I'm telling you, he wasn't like that before. He wasn't that bad. Things got so much worse in the last six or seven months that he hung himself, okay? So I, I can't tell you enough that these sweeps, they, they are incredibly demoralizing and just torture. They are torture. They are torture for these people. They were torture for me for three years. They did that. I remember the first time they did it to us and they took everything. Anything that I couldn't walk away or carry away, they took. And it's just, it's, it's devastating. It's devastating to them. And then you people do it over and over and over again. And I'm just begging you, if there's some way that this can stop, then just stop it because it's not helping anybody. It's not doing beneficial for anybody. You're making people angry and doing crazier things because they're already that small. Do you understand like just how small you make them feel and how angry it makes you feel? Like what would you do if someone just took all of your stuff and just threw it all away in front of you and told you, oh well, good luck, have a nice day. So I'm just I'm begging the people, just have some compassion, have some empathy, figure out a way to make this stop because it's it's not fair. It's really, really not fair because trying to come back from that is it takes weeks, you know, it even on the street, it takes weeks and weeks to get back even just a little bit of what they take. So please, just if you can, find a way to make this stop. And just please, I want to thank you. Wow, that that was tough to listen to. You could feel it. Um, that was Frankie giving testimony at the LA Health Commission. And I know it's a tough place to start, but it really frames what's going on. <laughs> from the perspective of somebody who's willing to share. And, and we got a couple more stories like this before we get into the solutions, but we do have solutions, but we need to hear this, it's important. Next, we have LaDonna, who is a veteran who's been experiencing sweeps during the pandemic. As Frankie was saying, they're still doing this for months. CDC has made it clear, anyone experiencing homelessness should not be displaced during the pandemic. Um, Regardless, the city of LA has resumed these dangerous sweeps, you know, for months. And I don't want to talk too much about it. Let's just have 
LaDonna, share more. I know it's difficult. Thank you for being here. Thank you for speaking tonight. LaDonna. Oh, hello. Hi, I'm LaDonna. I currently live on Edna. I actually am the closest tent next to the shelter, the um, Salvation Army sh shelter. Um, I like to say that I coined it, that that shelter hasn't even been up for six months before it already has Bob wires. Nobody's trying to get into that place, okay? <laughs> I, live, I live right next to it. Nobody's trying to get into that place. And it looks like Martha Stewart just like, you know, did a color palette for a little mini prison for them to put homeless people. I am not a criminal. So if you don't want me on the streets, if you don't want to see me on the streets, do not try to put me in a place where it's Bob Wired. It looks like a mini prison. I am not a criminal. I serve this country. Like, give me other options. Give me other options. I could talk about how hard the sweeps are and stuff like that, which the sweeps are hard, but the sweeps are hard because there's no point to them. Like, I can, I can go a whole what was me story, which I have. But I mean, at the end of the day, I'm really not doing anything. So for me to be prepared for the sweets, I should be. But the whole thing is just, it's pointless. You know, like it, they say they're gonna come, but they don't come. So it's not even like I can, I can, you know, be ready for it. So like, first of all, like the whole point of the sweets is just, it's pointless. All the money that they could be spending to do that they could be spending to like, to like, you know, put in a better program or a better shelter or, or low income housing or something. But you know, like the sweeps are just, the sweeps are just like a thing that they like, let us know how demeaning our situation in life is. I feel like, I feel like that's, that's the only point of them because they don't really clean. They don't put no bleach down. They leave debris everywhere. It's just to give us a little bit of hardship. Like, you know, like, of course, if I wanted to pay, you know, $2,000 for a studio apartment that I'm only at for six hours a day because I'm an active person and I'm working and it's just like, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. California has to offer me something else. It's just, it's just, it's the rent's too high. The rent's too high for me to even start to even think about doing something. You know what I mean? Like, and it's just any of the programs that you guys, that, that that's offered, like, I don't think that anybody ever works with the homeless. Like, is there a homeless liaison or something? Because like you guys, like, I feel like, I feel like everything like they, everything that they offer me is like some crazy shit for like an addict or if you've been in jail for all your life and you need to reconform to life and shit. I'm, I, or you're like, like they all, they, they treat you like that or they treat you like you're in some group homes. You know what I mean? Like I'm a grown ass person. I'm 35 years old. I served and I'm 35. Like, I don't need a curfew. Like, because I can't afford rent, I have to have a curfew. You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. And it's just like, hell no. I, if, you know, like, they're, they're like, oh, why don't you want to get off the streets? Because the program that they offer me has Bob Ryers on there. You know what I mean? They don't let you bring in your own food. I don't even, like, you live in a cubicle. You know what I mean? Like that's not enticing to me. They call it a bridge home. A bridge home to what? I've lived in homes, you know, most of my life. I never want to fucking cross that bridge. Like that bridge home thing, that shit, that, that's, that's for, I feel like that's for like, I don't know, somebody just coming out of jail. Like, you know, like, I don't know. That's not for me. Like, I don't, I don't have no pending cases. I have like a ticket for having a temp, tin up, you know, I'm a square from Delaware. I don't think it's fair that 
and everything that you that that that's giving to me to to like even get back on my feet feels like some group home program you know like addict type stuff which that doesn't apply to me and that doesn't even that doesn't even look lucrative to me you know what i mean like that seems like in and it's just in, in like and i think like everything that they do is funny like the, the whole thing like you know the um project room key no one actually has a room key anybody notice that like i just think like like you guys are fucking with us like it's called project room key no one has a room key funniest thing i've ever heard in my life and this is and these are the things that I always notice, and, and, and it's just like, where's like the legit program? I'm like, hey, you need a place to stay? You're able and working? You can do it? Like, give me that chance. Let me mess that up. Like, where's those programs at? Like, I don't want to start off with a whole, you know, program where, you know, like where I have to be in by 10 o'clock and stuff like that. Like, no. No, I want to be able to come in. I want to be able to cook my food. I want to, you know, like at least give me like, California has all this space. We have all this space. We have, there's just, I just, I just don't understand like why all the programs are just oriented towards like, I just feel like just people that are just getting out of jail or drug addicts, like, you know? And then even like the VA stuff, then I just got to live with like a, cre a bunch of crazies. Like, I just, I hate it all. I hate it all. Like, it's just like, there should be some type of thing. Like maybe you guys could do some type of qualifying something, but anything. But anyways, the sweets, the sweets are horrible. That's what we're supposed to be talking about. The sweets are horrible. They're stupid. There's no, there's no reason for them, but just to remind the homeless people that, our situation is demeaning and you know like put another hardship on us you know what i mean i know what so, you mean that's how that's pretty much that's pretty much it um, and what i have to say about the uh, the sweeps which i just went through today today was a sweep day and i like i myself like i i am very self-sufficient so I am ready. As far as my neighbors, no, not so lucky. Not so lucky. Not so lucky. And even and even sometimes I I slip up. But it's just like, you know, like I've lost things from like military ID to um, birth certificate, just, you know, and it's just like they don't really, you know, they don't really give you a chance. They don't really give you like, you know, they're not, they don't care. They don't care. They don't care about anything. And it just seems like, in Van Nuys, I don't know. I've heard that like other places, they don't have such a police force with them. But when I went to, like I see the Garcetti, um, the, the Garcetti thing where they bought in the bulldozer and everything and I emceed that, there was more of a, of a police presence at a suite than there was than us going down there and bringing like a bulldozer to the mayor's house. I shit you not. I swear to God, I swear to God. It's all on his so, head. You know, and just yesterday, like, you know, the hor like the cops on horses was just giving everybody tickets. Like, I'm like, what are you guys on horses? Like, why is that in why is that in the budget? I should be in the fucking budget. Ladonna, you should be in the budget. <laughs> and so thankful to you for coming on and sharing and being real with us, sharing your experience on what's working, what's not. One of the things though is 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 you said they don't care. We care here. That's why we're here. Uh, we're gonna get through this. Thank you for sharing. Um thank you. we're gonna come back to this and the solutions part again. Thank you, Ladonna. Um, thank you again. Next, we have Renee Grace. 
who's an attorney in Chatsworth. She's the executive vice president of the Chatsworth Porter Ranch Chamber of Commerce. She was formerly unhoused herself, and she's here to share her story of making it off the streets. Renee, Grace. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to such an important event. I want to let you know that um, when I was 19 years old, I escaped uh, multiple forms of abuse, fell into drug addiction, and suffered from chronic major depression, PTSD, among many other uh, disorders. I also was diagnosed with ADHD. So I had a lot of problems. And basically, I stole a car that I lived in, and then it got taken off the street with everything I had. And I was left with a backpack that had a pair of underwear and a jacket and about $15 to my name. And I had to find a place to scramble to and um, started finding some underpasses. Nobody wanted me around because I was literally not well and um, wasn't wanted at, back at the ranch. Um, didn't have any friends where I was. This was in Oakland, California. You know, but by miracle, you know, some some older women had taken me in, started looking after me in the park. Um, I had to learn things like if I go into a private space that's too private, I'll get raped. And I did. Um, and if I go into an open area, I'll be harassed by people in the police. And you know what? This was 1983 in the Bay Area. And I see the sweeps that people who are unhoused now are currently experienced. I don't think I would have survived that. I didn't have to deal with that. I dealt with a lot of other harassment and unsafe situations, but, and I thought growing up in this country, well, I could go to a shelter. And then I found out that you have staff at shelters who will sexually harass you. And if you don't get sexually harassed by the staff, other people that are sleeping in these, these dorms and cots next to you, they'll steal all your shit. They will steal everything you have if it is not tied to your body. How can you rebuild when you have nothing and it keeps that little bit you have keeps getting taken? I, I really hear Frankie's frustration that every time you try to get on your feet, everything's taken away from you. Well, I got lucky. And how I got lucky was I got arrested for shoplifting. I had a store manager at a uh, Stater Brothers, which I'm not allowed to go into. I'm lifetime banned from there. But uh, this Stater Brothers, the manager was okay with letting me eat. He could see I was a young girl and, um, and I was going in to eat. But after I got raped, um, I tried to steal a knife to protect myself. And uh, he had me arrested when I took the knife. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because when I went into the court, I was immediately placed into a deferment program and with no questions asked. No one told me to stay sober. No one told me I couldn't bring a dog. Nobody told me I couldn't bring a mate. They gave me a voucher for a hotel for 60 days. Now, the difference then was is I had a judge that says, come back in 60 days and you better have a job, young lady. Okay, but you know what? There were jobs available then. In fact, I could get two part-time jobs and be able to hold on to that little tiny hotel room because it was affordable enough. Anybody from the Bay Area knows Blondie's Pizza and the Shattuck Hotel? Upstairs, that's where they released all the mental patients and that's where I stayed. And it was kind of a scary place because you go up there, it's a shared bathroom. So going into the bathroom in the middle of the night was kind of a scary deal, but from there, I was able to ultimately get a job. He brought me back, the judge brought me back and gave me another opportunity for another job. And, and I started getting on my way and I got a job where I qualified for healthcare through Kaiser and their measly 20 visits a year. That's what I had to use to overcome sexual molestation that I went through for years from the age of nine to 14. It wasn't my parents, it was a neighbor. And, um, deal with the homeless and the rape on the street and to try to get back on my feet. And that's why Medicare for All is so important right now. It's so important that we make access to healthcare, including mental health care, because I needed it. I don't know how I survived. It was by God's grace and mercy. And we'll hear a lot about God's grace and mercy in this. But I slowly started attending 12-step programs and I did what I could. 
But the thing is, the one thing I was lucky to have that a lot of people don't have, they don't have resilience that I have. I was blessed with incredible resilience. And it was a gift to be given a lot of intelligence and to be able to be vocal. Not everybody has these resources. I survived based on those resources. I would not have survived. This is not something I went and earned. I'm not bragging about these credentials. I'm saying, gosh, I was really lucky to have these resources available to help me make it out. But how did I make it out? I had to sell my soul to Navient. $400,000 in student loan debt. I have never been free because the price I had to get in order to get that education in law school was tremendous. So I see what's happening to us in society. There is so much work to be done. This attitude, this myth of Americans pull yourself up by your bootstraps is exactly that. It is a myth. And that we have to start looking at this as a brotherhood and a sisterhood and a peoplehood. We must help each other and stop blaming each other and start blaming the people who are victimized. Hold on, I gotta stop my timer because I can go on forever. I thank you guys for this opportunity to share my story. It's a really hard story, but I'm glad to share it because maybe, just maybe it'll wake some of you guys up. I'm a member of this community just like the rest of you. I'm a business owner, a homeowner, but I know how much it hurts to be on the streets. And I hope that those of you who've never had to experience that won't ever have to experience it. And if you aren't experiencing, then pull out your wallet and give what you can of your time, your treasure and talents to these fine people of the West Valley People's Alliance and everyone who wants to end this problem of people being unhoused and have no access to resources. Thank you and good evening. Well, thank you, Grace. Thank you for your time, treasure and tremendous talent and Sharon, um, really moving. We're, we're a little bit behind on the schedule, but these are important stories. I think we need to share them. Everyone, uh, I hope you're appreciating it. Uh, again, I can't thank you enough, Grace. We're in it together. Looking forward to the next time we uh, touch elbows. Um, next, we have uh, Pilar Shavo, one of the co-founders of West Valley People's Alliance is gonna share uh, Reggie's story. Um, maybe I'll just hand it over to Pilar because she's going to share this story. Yeah, we had, I just want to note, you know, it's really obviously hard for folks who are on the streets to get on a Zoom. Um, and so we did have other people who were trying, one's having connectivity issues and not able to um, get on. And another one um, actually has a good reason he's not able to be on. He was illegally evicted and he's actually getting into temporary housing right now today. Um, so he could not speak tonight, but he gave permission to share his story. And I, I won't take a lot of time because I don't think I can do his story any justice, but I think it's important um, to highlight because as we know, you know, we are on the cusp of a tsunami of evictions. And if we think homelessness is bad right now in LA, we haven't seen anything. Um, if we don't take bold action against the evictions that are coming, because of the financial crisis people are experiencing in the middle of this pandemic, right? People cannot pay rent. Um, and, you know, landlords are taking advantage of people, harassing people, beating people up, threatening them and illegally locking them out. Um, and that's part of that is what happened to Reggie. Reggie um, was you know basically had no air conditioner his air conditioner was not getting fixed it was 120 degrees in his apartment in the middle of the heat wave and he told his landlord that if he didn't fix it he was gonna take some of the money out of his rent and go buy a portable air conditioner and while he was at the store buying that air conditioner his landlord illegally locked him out with, he's an elderly man, he's a retired um, engineer from Microsoft. He had medications that he needed that he could not get. And instead of the police helping with this illegal eviction, helping the tenant, um, they did not. They did the opposite. They would not let him in. They supported the landlord. Um, he was never able to get in to get his medication and he was left living in his car. 
Um, so, you know, this is just one story of the many, many stories um, that we are seeing. And we do also outreach every week, the West Valley People's Alliance and West Valley Homes Yes. And we have been seeing more and more tents on the streets. We're already seeing this happen. Where there was one tent, there's now five tents. We are seeing this throughout the West Valley. And so if we think that we are going to solve homelessness by ignoring the eviction crisis that is um, happening right now, we are wrong. Um, and so I, you know, I just want to put a pin in that as another piece of this, uh, the story around homelessness that we are really working to address as an organization. Thank you. Thank you for that, Pilar. And we had scheduled a little bit of time for Q and A. I had a whole thing on Hinduism, but because of time, uh, I think we're going to skip Q and A. Maybe hold it till the end. Is that all right, Pilar? So, so far we've shared some heart-wrenching stories, the kinds of things that bring us here today. I had a longer thing on, um, on my own faith, but you know, we're here because of our, some of these higher concepts, right? The golden rule, karma, dharma, devotion, faith, community, right? However you wanna define it you know, for yourself. These are guiding principles for lots of us, regardless of what we believe in. And I think that's why a lot of you are here today. And so, again, in the interest of time, let's, uh, we're going to have a whole panel with faith leaders, and it's, it's going to be beautiful. I want to bring on uh, Reverend Ray, Reverend Ray Wong uh, with LA Voice. Uh, they're going to uh, moderate the panel, and we've got a great lineup of speakers. I think uh, Ray, uh, uh, Reverend Ray will introduce folks, and, and we'll give folks a chance to turn this into a, a productive conversation, reflecting on what we just heard from people uh, who are willing to share their stories. Reverend? Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Um, just to see all of your faces here tonight um, just shows exactly the kind of heart um, that our community has um, and the way that we can rise and thrive together in this moment um, when it's, well, all of us are hurting. And I think we're feeling that pain and we're feeling that suffering collectively right now. And um, I don't know, I mean, the pandemic's been a hard season, but I wonder if it's a really good wake up, wake up call, excuse me, that we needed uh, to be able to see um, just how hard we all are struggling and how we need to get through this together. Um, before we begin our panel, I just wanted a huge shout out to LaDonna and Renee Grace. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, if it were not, I mean, we need to hear your voice and we, and you know, the solution is to be able to follow your lead and saying, this is what I have experienced. This is what we are experiencing. This is what we need to change together. So just grateful for your leadership, grateful for your story, grateful for your vulnerability to share with us tonight. Um, and I salute you and, and lift you up, um, as a leader amongst giants, um, just because we need, we need your voice. We need your leadership in this moment. Um, Tonight, we do have a powerful panel of people. Um, I'm gonna invite each of you to introduce yourselves of how you'd like to be uh, a, a little bit more about yourself, but we have uh, Dr. Dwayne Winrow, if you'd like to say hello yeah, and, and say a little that? bit about yourself and, um, and the community you're coming from. And you'll have to excuse the background noise of my children in the background. <laughs> well, she's talking about me. That's, um, I'm the uh, senior minister of the Reseda Boulevard Church and it is our mission to be community centric. I really came um, off of a very, you know, crowded schedule today. I wanted to be here. I didn't come with anything prepared because I wanted to do more listening than anything else. Um, I really believe that in order to really be engaged and address problems in the right way, you know, you some way you got to be identified uh, and you got to know. I appreciate, you know, the presentation of Grace. Uh, the, and also the first lady, I got the impression she's ex-military. Uh, I thought, you know, what she was saying was very powerful. Uh, those voices have to be heard. I was recruited recently. Well, recently, I say recently, uh, but a few weeks ago uh, to help or to team with Judge Carter in terms of trying to provide uh, shelter for uh, homeless living under bridges and this type of thing. It was kind of my first experience in going and listening to particular meetings that had to do with the bureaucracy involved. 
And one of the things I learned from that is a lot of money is allocated for homelessness that's not reaching the homeless. It's not really reaching the situation. It's just, it's just bureaucratic stuff, you know, and the people that's supposed to be addressing the problem has no real, real connection to the problem. There's a lot of stuff being delegated to this, that, and the other, uh, while, you know, what needs to be done in terms of helping is not being done. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm more into, I came really tonight more interested in listening uh, to, to these solutions. I know this, uh, that in order, you know, for people such as myself in, in positions such as leadership of faith communities, uh, it begins with, first of all, just a right theology, a right, a right view of God. Many times churches are so disengaged because they revel in one view of God. If you go back to Genesis, and I don't want to sound like I'm preaching, you know, but there are two views of God given in Genesis. One is what is called a transcendent view that you see in the first chapter of Genesis, where God is far off and he speaks and everything happens. And many traditions just revel in that, you know, God who says, let there be light and there is light, you know, but there's another view uh, of God that starts in the second chapter where God comes walking in the cool of the day. He comes walking in the garden. It's called the eminence of God, God with us, God among us. And I think, you know, we never get to that. You know, we never get to God being among the people. Uh, we never get to Isaiah's concept where, the, where he talks about the redemptive or the, the, the suffering servant as having no beauty that no one should desire him. You know, Dr. So in, a, in a beautiful picture of God that we don't see the eminence of God of, as having no beauty, the untouchable uh, the that, that grew up in Nazareth, that didn't grow, grow up in the king's palace. And, and so I think, you know, we have, to, we have to begin with a right view, you know, of, of God that's eminent, that, that can I be identified with the, with the disenfranchised, with the, with the homeless, with people that we would consider uh, you know, that we need to be distanced from and this type of thing. One of the things I learned just in the experience that I had with Judge Carter going out to talk to the homeless, I, I began to realize I wasn't even dressed for the occasion. <laughs> you Dr. Know? Winrow, I just wanted to get, we, um, we're just getting through introductions, and but oh, it was so sorry. great to hear. That's okay. <laughs> but I, hey, I, I'm, a, I'm a preacher myself, so I get it. We, uh, <laughs> we are used to preaching and we are enjoying your preaching, but I just want to make sure that we give a chance for our other uh, panelists to be able to introduce themselves. Um, but you, I mean, I, I uh, it's so exciting and um, inspiring to hear sort of um, the the word of faith into the table here and what you're and why you are in this fight and how we're being called in this moment as mm -hmm. as faith leaders. So I'd like to invite in this moment. Um, Imam Suhail uh, Mullah, um, if you want to introduce yourself and just briefly, um, maybe uh, why you're here tonight, um, and then we'll introduce the others and we'll go into our, our questions. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Reverend uh, Ray, uh, Ray Chen. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Suhail Mullah. I am the resident scholar at the Islamic Society of West Valley, uh, uh, a mosque in Canoga Park. And I'm also the director of what is called the Khalil Center. The Khalil Center, Khalil in Arabic means friend, the intimate, uh, intimate friend. It's a community. It's it's a, it's a community counseling center um, focused on the Muslim community and their needs um, here in Northridge. And so I'm here tonight. Um, like Dr. Duane said, I'm I'm just here to listen. Um, I'm humbled by Ladana's story, Grace's story. And um, you know, I, I there's nothing there's nothing for me to you know there's nothing for I'm I'm humbled <clears throat> excuse me I'm humbled I, I can't you know when when you hear stories like that um, I, I I realize how blessed I am and how how much I take things for granted and how much I need to do and how much I need to push my community to do so I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Imam Mullah. Um, I'd like to next invite uh, Caroline Ward Holland, um, if you can introduce yourself and thank you for being here and joining our panel today. Thank you for um, having me. Um, I am a tribal elder with the Fernandino Tatabian Band of Mission Indians. 
my grandmothers uh, are Mary Cook Garcia and Margaret Rivera Ward, both of which share one common ancestry and that's Leandra Colta. And Leandra and her ancestors were known to have inhabited this area prior to European contact. Um, I'd like to say that the first um, speaker or story that we heard tonight just mirrors what we could imagine colonization was like. So it, it will leave a lasting um, effect of trauma. This is so um, I was happy to hear all the speakers. Um, I feel um, at this point, what um, what I do in my community with our homeless people here, um, it's not nearly enough. So I'm open to suggestions. I would like to um, be more active um, in, in my community. Um, and I do have a few ideas of how to do that. So um, thank you again for having me and I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, Caroline. And lastly, I'd like to introduce um, the Reverend uh, Stephanie Jager. Um, if you can introduce yourself and why you're here today. Hello, I'm Stephanie Jager. I'm the pastor of St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in North Hollywood and um, also the director of a separate secular nonprofit that we founded a couple of years ago, Now Home Alliance, to expand the work that we were doing or called to do um, around homelessness, housing, advocacy, and services. Um, in the east side of the valley. So it's really wonderful to finally be in the same space with um, you on the other side of the valley, on the West Valley. And we do much of the same sort of thing, work that you're doing. And I'm just so grateful to be in a space of, of, uh, of compassion and compassionate action, I think is, um, that's what we're about at St. Matt's is compassionate action. And that's what brings me here today is to see and to, to listen and to um, share, to listen to your stories of compassionate action and, and what is possible. How can we imagine more compassionate action that really does meet the needs of um, the folks who share their story today? Thank you so much. Um, I'm mindful of time and we have about 20 minutes left of this um, panel time. And so I'm gonna just uh, ask a couple questions to a few of you and we just love, I, we'd love to hear some of your thoughts on some reflections. Um, I'm gonna start with um, you, Imam Mula. I was wondering, can you tell, um, share with us um, more, I mean, much of our faith traditions calls us to love our neighbor. And I was just wondering, in for you and your faith tradition, um, in what way does your faith tradition shape the way that you are acting and you are called in loving your neighbor and being a part of these conversations and leading the kind of work that you are doing um, in your community um, around um, housing and homelessness? And Imam Mula, you're still on mute if you can unmute yourself. So I, um, I'm sorry, I look funny with this mask half on. I, somebody just walked in the office. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, the neighborly needs and neighborly rights in Islam are a huge um, uh, part of our faith. And there's a prophetic saying that says, um, the one, uh, someone who does not, who's, who, whose neighbor is not safe from their harm will not enter paradise. And, you know, paradise is the ultimate goal. That's what we're, we're living for. We're trying to live right so that God will be pleased with us. And that's where we ultimately go. And, um, and um, being, you know, uh, people who are conscious of our neighbor's needs and rights. Um, there's another uh, beautiful prophetic saying that says, um, um, that someone doesn't believe in me, this is the Prophet Muhammad, who is a central figure for, in Islam, um, doesn't believe in Islam. If um, their neighbor is hungry and their stomach is full, um, and he knows, right? So if we know that our neighbors next door, uh, whether they be, wherever they may be, or don't have their needs met, we're absolutely not fulfilling our our responsibility and not taking care of 
um, what God is asking us to take care of. And so, um, you know, this is a central part of our faith. And it, it, um, I can't say that we all put it to action and, and manifest uh, those actual needs amongst us. And so it is important that, you know, people are mobilized through organization, through institution. And, um, and that's why we appreciate, you know, being connected uh, to organiza organizations like this, West Valley People's Alliance and, and others that are working with the homeless, because that is, a, that is a need, right? There are a lot of good people out there, but we just need, we need a proper forum and format and infrastructure by which to be mobilized by, right? And I think all of us will preach a similar message tonight, um, but the organizational part of it is crucial to the whole, to the whole uh, deal. Thank you so much, Imam Mula. Um, next, I'd like to ask a, a question um, to uh, Miss uh, Caroline Ward Holland. Um, you know, Black families are disproportionately pushed out of their homes. We know this um, across the board in our history, um, and we know that right now, we're experiencing right now. Black Angelinos are 10 times more likely to face homelessness. And we also know that prior to this pandemic, um, two people were dying every day because of homelessness and houselessness, and now four people are dying every day. Um, LASA, which is the Los Angeles Housing Homeless excuse me, Services Authority, um, reports that in response to uh, the pandemic efforts, they house over 6,000 people in just a few months. Um, but at the same time, the commissioner of LASA, Jacqueline Wagoner, who chairs LASA's ad hoc committee on black people experiencing homelessness states, even with the significant gains made in placing people into housing with services, it is not keeping pace with those Angelinos face, face, falling into homelessness. We need to solve for both she says, that requires us to increase our housing supply. It requires us to get upstream to transform our foster care, health care, criminal justice, and other systems to stop them from pushing people into homelessness. And requires us to center solutions in racial equity so that we can dismantle the legacy of racism that still shapes our region's vast inequalities of income, wealth, and opportunity. Um, now, Ms. Ward, I know that in the um, indigenous community, or excuse me, Ms. Holland, in the indigenous community, you have, since the very beginning of the roots of this country, um, you have faced discrimination and been forced out of your homes from the very beginning. So I'm just wondering what you can share about how you see the system um, continuing on today in these forms of racism, uh, institutionalized racism, and how you, um, what you recommend and what you can share um, in uh, the organizing and the work and the continual community that the indigenous community uh, works together to bring a different voice, a different perspective, a different way of see, being able to see a new way where all are housed and no one is no longer displaced. Um, I can share with you that um, we very, we are in the very direct line of systematic racism. You know, we have um, not come very far, as far as I'm concerned. I'm, maybe the people here on this panel and and, and so forth, but the, nobody recognizes um, what's been done and the trauma that comes with that. And and so many times I've heard, you know, well, it's ancient history. It's not ancient history. It's not ancient history. And for um, landless tribes such as ours, um, we we live in our own cities and our concrete villages where nobody even knows that we were here. It was so easy to be erased so they didn't have to deal with um, what, what had happened. So I, no offense to our, our leaders here, but um, this 99% of our problems, I believe in our society is based on that religion. It is for, it is a, it's designed for people to fail. It is, the system is designed for people to fail. We come from a natural system. We dam, we dam up the waters, you know, we, we don't have any rain because we don't have any deposition. We don't have our natural ways of life. Even if we do have live in a city, we still have um, this metropolis of just disaster. So this is, this is traumatizing. For communities, black communities, any community of color, you are most certainly not as equal as other communities of um, 
let's say um, Caucasian or or what have you. And this this is the problem. This is most certainly the problem. So calling attention to that, um, the first speaker she talked about um, how demoralizing and how um, um, they felt when they were doing these sweeps. That is going to be a long lasting. Um, factor of trauma. And then how are we going to deal with that? Those are the things that we need to deal with. We have very done very little as in Los Angeles. And um, I believe it's upon our faith leaders. I'm not a, a, our tribal faith leader, but uh, to recognize that this is an issue. This is most certainly an issue. And affordable housing is almost nil in my area where we live. And then that's where they want, the city wants to move people out of our areas and put them in the desert somewhere up in Palmdale or Lancaster and then have their communities for um, a better opportunity, real estate, for real estate. So I hope that answered your question. This is my view on the whole situation here. And I think that we just all need to recognize that we are in a very trying time of racism and it's going to get worse. Thank you so much, Caroline Holland. Um, my next question um, uh, is for uh, Dr. Duane Rinro. Um, in January of this year, um, we released results uh, of the 2020 Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count, which showed that um, 66 1,436 people in Los Angeles were experiencing homelessness. This count, of course, was before the impacts of COVID-19 could be felt, responded to, um, and also problematize um, our homelessness issue. And while we know efforts such as Project Room Key, rent freezes, hygiene stations, eviction moratoriums were enacted during the pandemic, we also know that they were and are only temporary solutions. For example, our COVID rates are now at its highest than it's ever been here in LA. And the LA Times reported this morning that there are zero beds open in intensive care units in Southern California. Meanwhile, our eviction protections in the state will end on January 31st of next year. That's just over a month away if our state legislators don't act soon. And currently there's also no relief planned to help individuals and families pay back rent. So we are seeing people growing and falling deeper, deeper into financial hardship and resulting emotional distress. So Dr. Winrow, I'm wondering, how is your faith community talking about processing and responding to these very real crises right now? And you started earlier um, when you introduced yourself, did you say just a little bit more, but I'm gonna give you a, um, if you can share in a shorter timeline, I'm noticing <laughs> sure we get to the last question and, and everybody gets to share. Yeah, one, one thing that, um, you know, any community of faith has to realize uh, first of all, is that we exist in the community, not simply for ourselves, but for the community, you know, and that's one thing that we're really trying to activate, you know, among us. And that means that we have to, we have to have partnerships. We can't, we don't have the resources just in and of ourselves, you know, to handle such a, such a huge, you know, problem. Uh, that we have to align ourselves with other organizations that share common purposes. Uh, to create the type of alliance uh, that can be more effective. We're better together, as someone would say. And then the other thing that I, I just want to say just briefly is that as I have listened to, um, you know, the first ex-military young lady speak, uh, and then Grace also, how we have to learn how to help people and maintain their dignity. You know, many times you help people and I, I, I remember earlier in our church experience where people would come for help and then you help them to seem like they just disappear, you know, as soon as you help them. But what was really happening is how you help them. You know, if you make them feel less than, you help them in a way that you're looking down on them and this type of thing, uh, then you're creating a greater problem. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot that can be said about that. But I think we have to have a vision of community, number one. Uh, when we talk about that first question about neighbor, uh, I come out of the civil rights era where what the drive and vision of that era was a vision of the beloved community. Uh, and that really comes out of, out, of, out, of, out of New Testament texts where Paul talks about a community that has no second class citizenship. 
you know, that's that's the vision. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot to be said about that, but it's, it's a lot to be gained by listening to people who have experienced all of these various forms of help, but didn't experience it in a way where they felt their dignity was being maintained. And I think when we can arrive at a position where we know how to help people, you know, and, and love people, then I think we're going to be at a, in a better position. Thank you, Dr. Winro. Um, and this last question goes to uh, the Reverend Stephanie Jager. Um, over the last nine months, um, we've seen our city and county come together um, in an unprecedented way to protect our most vulnerable by sharing resources and passing policies that have prevented evictions, significantly curbing the infection rates um, and the rise in homelessness. But we also know that it's still not enough as folks continue to be burdened by under and unemployment rising debt and health challenges. Now, many solutions have been led by community leaders and they've been presented. Uh, for example, cancel rent and cancel uh, mortgages uh, campaign, uh, student debt relief, uh, a call to return our resources to the community um, of housing, counseling, education, jobs, and alternatives to incarceration instead of funding going towards policing our neighbors on the streets. So as a leader in the community, what solutions have you seen, heard, and recommend um, that you think it would take to address homelessness um, in light of the pandemic, and especially so that we will end stronger than we started. Well, I think um, if we, we we really can build on the success of the uh, Measure J initiative, and work really, uh, I would I would say devote much of our attention in the coming months to. Um, helping to steer how that reinvestment in the community might go. Um, I think groups say, like- Could you just share a little bit about Measure J for those who are, are watching yeah. and listening and learning tonight who may not have, may not know enough about Measure J? Sure. So Measure J was one of the, uh, was on our ballot in, in November and did pass. And it sought to require um, a percentage of the LA County budget to be dedicated to the reinvestment in services in communities such as mental health care, um, rather than to fund law enforcement solutions to um, community problems. I, mean, I, I have to say that I, I, I think that the solution to uh, homelessness and all of the other issues that you have raised really, that that solution lies within the grasp and power of community organs, organizations like this one and the one um, that I lead in the, uh, in the East Valley. Um, I think we're the ones who um, can sustain um, our influence and um, really help uh, help the uh, government sources um, to direct their resources into those programs that would really help. Um, the individuals. I would take the um, example of um, our speakers tonight. Um, you know, I often get complaints from law enforcement who say, well, nobody, you know, law enforcement will say, well, nobody, none of, nobody who's unhoused wants to, to go into a shelter. And I always turn that around and to, whenever I hear that and I say, well, would you? Right? We, we need to come from a place of, of respecting the worthiness of each and every person. Um, who has inherent dignity because they are, in my tradition, I'd say they're made in the image of God. And so each person has, has this inherent dignity. And um, I think we can help to um, craft solutions that really work by um, taking very active roles in these budget conversations um, and, and you know, provide investment opportunities, frankly, for these public funds um, for, the, for the work that we do. Um, I think it's amazing that, you know, through the relationships that you're building with the unhoused in your community, it would seem to me that you would be able to craft a, um, a platform for action and possible solutions um, in, in your neighborhood, uh, in your neighborhoods um, that could really be identified and presented as, um, you know, as a pathway for um, the city to invest in. So I, I think that is is one of the main um, the main things that that um, we can do. I do want to 
if I might just speak just very briefly to something that you, you asked just a moment ago uh, about the eviction crisis. And I just, I just want to really urge anyone who is associated with any faith community to really look at what partnerships they can build. I, I think um, that uh, Dr. Wienro really um, touched on something really important. Um, for us to be effective, we have to build partnerships. And I would just urge every community and every faith community to build partnerships with the neighborhood legal services in um, the Valley and to be part of the um, Right to Counsel Coalition. I don't know if your organization is, but I don't know how familiar you are with Right to Counsel, but I think that that is probably the single most important initiative to be supporting um, in, in this season as we face evictions. The Right to Counsel movement seeks uh, legal representation for any person who is facing eviction. Right now, uh, um, persons facing eviction uh, do not receive any kind of public defender support, but uh, data shows that people who do, who are facing eviction, who have a public defender uh, or some legal representation on their side, um, generally the eviction rates are reduced to uh, uh, like 25%. So about 78% in the city of Philadelphia, for example, that's had this program longer, 78% um, of persons facing eviction are not evicted. And so if we have to put our voice behind something right at this juncture, I would really strongly urge us to, to do that as a collective um, with faith communities and, uh, and other organizations that we're a part of. It's absolutely critical um, that we do that. Thank you so much, Reverend Jager. Um, this was a powerful panel. I know that um, there's so much that we could learn from our panelists today and probably many questions that we might have. So I encourage you, if you'd like to feel free to um, place them in the chat. And if there's time at the end of um, this meeting today, uh, we'll have a chance to come back to our panelists and be able to dive in a little deeper. Um, but it has been such an honor to be able to hear a little bit from each of you about the work that you all are engaged in, the ideas you have, um, and the faith that has shaped um, uh, what we can become um, as we uh, rise and thrive together through this and build a, um, a world where everybody belongs and everybody has a home and everyone lives with dignity. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna pass it on to um, Ankur. Hi, hi, Reverend Ray. I'm actually stepping in for Ankur now for the rest of the uh, the rest of this meeting. and. We're going to turn now to some really um, concrete solutions and concrete solutions that I think are very exciting and concrete solutions that I think are revolutionary. But before we do that, I just want to speak for one more minute about this idea of community, about this idea that I think our faith leaders are speaking to of who is my neighbor, because I think there's something revolutionary in the idea of recognizing that we are one community, that it's that, that we don't draw a distinction and we don't draw distinctions along lines of faith uh, for people who are a different religion or of people who have no religion. We don't draw distinctions along lines of race and we don't draw distinction along lines of need because I think that comes up so often when we're talking about these issues of homelessness is we say, well, there's us and there's them. There's us who are, who are giving of our, our time, our talent, our treasure, and there's them who need to receive it. And that's not how it works. I think what's so powerful about the idea that we're one community is that there is no us and them, but that instead, everything we do for each other is mutual. Everything is done in a spirit of mutuality of recognizing that we are each other's neighbors. And I think this comes up especially when we're talking about, about sweeps, when we're talking about who has the right to be in our communities. I think we have to recognize Really, the idea of neighbors means that our communities are for all of our residents, that we have to push back as people of goodwill, we have to push back against the construction of our neighborhoods that draws a distinction between people who are housed, the people who count, the people who have homes or who rent or who seem respectable enough to count as, as real neighbors, as members of our community, and the people 
who we are told don't belong and should be swept, should be removed, should be pushed out of view because what, what all these sweeps are about is about making people invisible and about pushing people out and saying they're not really part of our community. And I think we, as people of goodwill and as people who are coming together, have to recognize that there are forces, political and economic forces, forces that I would call evil forces that are trying to force us apart so that we don't recognize our neighbors and each other and we don't recognize how much we owe each other. So before, before I introduce our next speaker, I just want to, to speak to this idea of mutuality and I want to, to, to bring in a quote from one of my favorite speakers, Father Greg Boyle from Homeboy Industries, because he says this, I think, better than anyone else I've ever heard. And, and what, Father, what Father Boyle says is, we don't go to the margins to help those who are on the margins. He says, we go to the margins to find salvation and the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the people who are on the margins lead us to true kinship and exquisite mutuality. And what I love is that idea that in our communities, when we recognize the ways that we belong to each other and the ways that we are each other's neighbors, that we find this, this true kinship, this exquisite mutuality. And I think the best solutions to our crisis, the best policy solutions come from that recognition and that mutuality. So with that, we're gonna talk a little bit about policy solutions. And to start that conversation, I'm, I'm really tremendously excited to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Sam Simbaris, who's a clinical psychologist. He is an expert in the housing first model. He revolutionized the approach to addressing homelessness when he developed the first housing first program, Pathways to Housing, which has now been replicated in multiple cities. He's the founder and CEO of the Pathways to Housing First Institute. He also serves as the executive director for the Greater Los Angeles VA, the UCLA Center of Excellence for Training and Research on Veterans Homelessness and Recovery. And he's on the faculty at U in the UCLA Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences. So Dr. Zimbaris, I hope I got all that right. I want to say thank you so much for being here and I will now uh, turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much Hannah and uh, good evening everyone. It's been uh, wonderful to be part of the conversation and I hope to add in some small way to our thoughts about where do we go next. I, um, I have two questions. Um, how much time do you want me to do I have here? I just want to sort of make sure uh, we've scheduled you to speak for about 15 minutes and then a Q&A. Okay. So um, is it okay if I show some slides? Uh, I, do I go share a screen and uh, do it like that? Uh, someone would have to help me with that because it says hosts disabled the sharing. I think you now have the option to share your screen. Okay. I think Phil Here Arger's saying something. <laughs> I see, okay. Um, I just need to find, I'm sorry, one second. Looking for the, hmm. the share screen. Well, not sure exactly why uh, this is the share screen here. Okay. Um, I might have to just, I can't, I can't find the um, part, the, the document that's open on my uh, computer. So I'm not sure exactly why that is. I think I'm just going to have to talk it out because um, it's not readily available here. I was going to say, if you want to send it to me really quickly, I could pull it up for you too. Okay. I'll give it one more try. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I'm just going to have to uh, present it um, on the one second here, speaker view, 
share. No. Okay. Um, can you can you hear me all right? Hello. We hear you. Okay. Yeah, we hear and, you clearly. But, but, right, but you can't see the slides, so um, I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to present it without the um, slides because it's not loading, and I'm taking up way too much time in trying to. Uh, find this thing. Okay, I if found it's it. I found I also I found if you it. wanted to oh, okay, I found it. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, now uh, the this view, I think. Slideshow view. We are now see yes, we are now seeing your slideshow. Okay. Okay, here we go. Great. Okay, I'm really sorry about that. At um, multiple programs opened at the same time, so it wasn't showing up when I hit share. So I'm going to spend, uh, I'm not going to use the uh, full minutes. I will deduct the two minutes and rush through it a little bit quicker just to make sure it's, it's all fair. I'm going to talk to you about this program called Housing First that we invented about 1990. A group of us that was actually um, made up of people like myself who are more on the clinical side, but also people like LaDonna. Uh, and people like uh, Lene Grace. It was a collaboration of people with lived experience and people trying to do something about homelessness. I think the reason this Housing First program, as it's come to be called, is so uh, effective is because from the beginning, it included the voice of the people most affected by the program. We targeted specifically people who were most visible. We were actually, uh, the clinical group of us was working in a hospital and we were very much involved in some of the activities we, we heard about tonight. Involuntary commitment of people who were homeless and possibly a danger to themselves or others. You know, this very uh, well-known 5150 approach that um, some mental health slash police approaches are taking. Uh, and of course the uh, sweeps, uh, police and sanitation were a big part of that. But we were focused on people who are literally homeless and we wanted to do something about it. There were many different approaches just like there are now. And I think that uh, we have had in this meeting really a coherent approach to uh, our values in terms of housing as a basic human right, talking about, you know, where is the love? I mean, how many, how many provider programs uh, and meetings and conferences do you go to where the word love is never mentioned and yet it's at the epicenter of anything that's going to be healing. So uh, one of the reasons I wanted to participate, I thought, you know, the, 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 this group has its, its finger on the pulse. In fact, I can tell you that our mantra when we finally put this program together as a collaborative, we came up with our own ethos, which had three statements. One was we believe that housing is a basic human right. Two, we believe that people experiencing homelessness do not have to prove that they're housing ready or be clean and sober or in treatment in order to get housing. Everybody deserves housing and is worthy of housing. And the third principle was we believe in love, respect, and creating possibilities. So, uh, you know, the, it's, a, it's an essential piece of this. One of the ways I think that we have not, even though we know how to solve homelessness, we have not solved homelessness, is that this kind of coherent vision and understanding about what needs to be done, we're all in kind of, uh, you know, uh, our own small worlds, and there are many different conflicting opinions about what should be done. We're talking now, even though we want to eliminate us and them, we are us in here and them out there wants to do sweeps, you know, like, we're not going to get to somewhere where we're going to solve this problem unless us and them become one. Uh, we're going to have to figure out, you know, we're going to have to figure out what's before us, what we learned in the last election, that there's 74 million people that probably do not agree with what approaches we're going to be talking about tonight. And why don't we have homelessness solved? I'm going to make the point in a minute that this is why we don't have it solved because we don't have a national, a state 
or a city uniform policy that we're all agreed upon. We're, we're politicizing and disagreeing about everything. Our outcomes in homelessness are the same as our outcomes with the COVID-19 COVID pandemic. Terrible for the same reasons. When you ask epidemiologists around the world, what is it about this problem that's so uh, out of control in the United States, the survey of about 100 epidemiologists from around the world said, well, there are two things. One is the individualistic uh, culture embedded in our, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstrap, someone said earlier, that culture. And the other is no coherent policy. You know, you, if you wear a mask, you're, uh, you know, of one political persuasion. And if you don't, you're another. We don't, we've never had that coherence. And the same dysfunction, if you will, or disagreement is also true in homeless policy. It's, the, you know, when we use our system of taxation and free market enterprise and, you know, monetizing even the cost of homelessness. Uh, that is creating homelessness, that same system is not going to solve homelessness. We need a different value system and a different approach. Okay, um, that was my political rant. I'm gonna get to the program now. Most homeless services still true today, you know, are not about housing first. They're about what, uh, what uh, LaDonna exquisitely described, not only you know, treating people like a criminal or an addict or somehow less than, but insisting on a series of steps, you know, and, and uh, the people either cannot or will not participate and there's no dignity in that approach. And even though it's in business because every homeless service is filled to capacity because there are so few homeless services that any service you open is gonna be filled to capacity. So if your criteria for a success is number of people serve, everyone's gonna be doing tremendously well. Oh, people tell, I've served 16,000 meals today. Is that a good thing though? I mean, maybe that's not so good, you know? I mean, how many people's lives have you given a house to? Maybe the criteria should be, we should be paying for what we wanna get. We wanna end homelessness, let's pay for ending homelessness, not for tents and sleeping bags and meals and, and the rest of it. I'm not advocating by any means to let people go hungry. I'm just talking from a policy perspective. And in the policy perspective, you get what you pay for. Housing first is this. There's nothing to jump over. You go from the streets right into an apartment of your own. Housing is a basic human right. People are asked uh, you know, where they want to live to the extent possible. You know, it's within the fair market rent, uh, which is, of course, a increasingly small target in most uh, cities that do well. You know, on the West Coast from Washington down to San Diego and from the East Coast from Boston to Miami, all of, you know, the coastal cities are, are, are doing well economically, you know, Dow Jones through the roof. But every city that does well economically also has disproportionately high numbers of homeless people. That's where all the homeless population is. When you look at the distribution nationally, it's along the same economically affluent timelines. And that's because those two things are absolutely related. You know, gentrification brings more homelessness and there we are. So it's not, uh, it's not a surprise that more people are homeless in places that are well to do, uh, they're also more populated and the rents tend to increase much, much quicker than they do in the middle of the country. The Housing First program is not only about housing, it's about housing and services. It's a very robust program providing the kind of services that people need. If we're talking to someone that doesn't need a lot of services, we won't provide a lot of services, but mostly we're targeting people who have a disabilities, often mental illness, addiction, health problems, and we make house calls. It's housing first, but not housing only. We make a lot of house calls. We make sure people are taken care of for as long as they need to. We also make sure that the services, quote unquote, is everything people need. I mean, just because you are a nurse or a social worker or a person with lived experience, if someone wants to go and join the museum or the library or needs to go 
shopping for groceries, it's not like that's not my job. We take responsibility in this kind of no wrong door approach, whatever the person needs, we help them with. And also we take responsibility for making sure the person has services. It's not like they have to prove or they have to engage us. We assume if we've just housed someone who's been on the street and is not doing well, we have to keep visiting them and helping them and find out ways to connect, not for them to connect with us, but for us to connect with them. We take that responsibility. Um, the program, uh, as was said at the beginning, has been uh, implemented in a lot of places, not because I'm so good at describing it or at showing slides, or, as you've noticed, it's because we've done research studies that show that this thing, when you go housing and then services versus that stairway, earn it or deserve it first, uh, it, we have an 80% housing stability rate compared to 40% for the other program. I'll just say that one more time because it's, uh, it's not a small difference. 80% or better actually housing stability rate by going housing first and then services versus sobriety treatment first and then housing. So it's, it's huge. And, and I think, you know, published the American Journal, uh, it was a randomized control trial in Canada, five cities tested housing first versus treatment as usual was tested in France. There's a ton of literature on this. All of them randomized controlled trials, very, very strong evidence. The VA, I would say the HUD-VASH program is the only example in the States that really does a good job with Housing First for the most part, as does the um, Department of uh, Housing, uh, Department of Health Services here in LA. They work with brilliant corners and they have that kind of uh, housing for health program for people who are frequent users of the emergency room. Those are two good examples of the housing first model locally. But it is, uh, it is uh, pretty much all over the West. And I want to make this point about just my earlier point about the, the Gini coefficient and homelessness. The greater the income disparity in a country, this is what I've learned in these travels, the greater the income disparity, the more homeless people per capita. Right. So it, not only are there more homeless people because of the way the market uh, is, uh, is uh, distributed uh, inequitably, but also in those countries, there are fewer uh, social or health or mental health or housing services. You think about every other country, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, national health plans, social housing. We have neither. Our per capita rate is almost twice of those countries. One brief example from an international lesson, and this is really my take home about what do we need to, what do we need to advocate for as a group? And I would say that uh, from, from this example, this is what I've learned. There's a, there's a short article on this, which I'll be happy to send to Pilar and you could circulate it around. It's a study looking at what happened in Finland and in Ireland over a 10 year period. Uh, 2008 to 2018. Everybody was doing these things called 10-year plans at that time. And these two countries are compared because they had a similar population, you know, about uh, 5 million people each, one major city, Dublin and Helsinki. They had relatively uh, about the same number of shelter beds, 600 in Ireland and 564 in Finland. And they had, um, you know, somewhere close to the same number of people who were homeless, somewhere between two and 3,000 in 2008. And they were going to, you know, do housing first and end chronic homelessness. But what happened in 2008 was the financial crisis. And there was so much pressure to get people off the street, just like we live in Los Angeles every day. You know, how many times have we heard Garcetti say, oh, it's an emergency, homeless is an emergency. How is homelessness an emergency if it's been around for 40 years? You know, and yet that sort of justifies bridge housing or other emergency things. So this is what happened in Ireland exactly. From 2008 to 2018, they increased the number of shelter beds from 600 to about 2,500, right? They like quadrupled the number of shelter beds because they wanted to get people off the streets of Dublin. There was a lot of political pressure. Well that resulted in homelessness growing in Ireland from 2000 to 4000 in the same year period. So not only do they have more shelter beds, but they doubled their homeless count, 2000, close to 5000, sorry. 
in, in Finland, they stuck to their guns. They started closing shelters, reducing the number of shelter beds, reducing transitional housing and investing in the purchasing and building and rehabbing of market rate apartments with a sliding scale with a subsidy. In Finland, in the same 10 year period, they went from 3,250 people who were homeless in 2008 to now 52 people. Their shelter system is one shelter, a small shelter in Helsinki for 52 people because in that same 10 year period, they have developed or rehabbed 12,000 uh, affordable housing units. So that's, you know, what, what, what is the lesson from these places? It's like any program that we hear about, you know, proposition A, B, C, or D, if it doesn't have permanent affordable housing embedded into the program design, it's not going to solve homelessness. We have to stay focused and united in our message of, housing and homelessness and some people will need services okay thank you that's, that's thank my you rant. thank you so much for that presentation which i think was tremendously um informative and powerful i'm gonna open it up now for just a few minutes before we proceed to some uh further solutions to ask if there are any questions. Um, Dr. Simbaris is happy to answer those questions. If you have questions about, particularly about housing first and how we can put that into effect, um, you can at this time unmute yourself to ask a question or if you prefer, you can put the question in the chat. So uh, we'll just hold the space for a few minutes for questions here. And I wanna say I put in the chat this uh, link to a program uh, called um, um, it's uh, according to need. It's it's a five part series on homelessness in California by a reporter producer named Katie Mingle of of ninety nine percent invisible, and she it just it just released the last the fifth of the episodes released two days ago, and she follows people from Oakland uh, into homelessness and and sort of analyzes the California homeless service system. It's it's a really good piece. Thank you. I'll ask a question to get things going. Um, so you and I had a, a conversation before the program too. And one of the things I think that it's helpful for people to hear is kind of how do we get from where we are now to ending homelessness, right? How do we get from A to B? Um, and I know you were talking about the example of Project Roomkey that, you know, ultimately it seems like it really comes down to political will, right? Because when they wanna figure out the money, they wanna figure out a solution, suddenly they can house thousands of people in a month, That's you know? Right. That's right. You know, uh, all of the ideas about sobriety or treatment readiness or any of that, when homelessness because of COVID was defined as a public health emergency, the governor you know, makes the money available, the hotels are open and everyone gets a room of their own because it's safe. It's always been, it's always been a health crisis, but you know, it, it just uh, had a completely different impact on their COVID. And, and it, I, to me, it shows that it's this entire business of homelessness is not about trying to figure out what the solution is. We know what the solution is. It's really, how do we harness the political will like COVID did for us to insist that everyone deserves a safe, affordable place of their own. I mean, not the hotels are completely imperfect because it's not a lease, it's not a standard lease, there's no tenant protections, we talked about the evictions, but just from a can we do this perspective, can we muster the political will and move thousands of people right into housing right away? The answer is yes, we can if we, if we muster the will to do so. Thank you. Are there other questions? I have a statement more so than a question, but also part of it is a, a question as well. Uh, I think Sam touched on something about it's a national thing. It's not only in the in California or in those supposedly rich states or richer states. What I find uncomfortable is we are the richest country in the world. 
and we have just about the highest number population of homelessness. I think this is an embarrassing thing for us. When we try to help other people, that's fine. But the money that we give to other countries, I think we as citizens have the responsibility I think we have just lost your sound for a minute. Yes. Dollars, that's a B that we give in aid to, uh, to Israel for military uh, aid. Can you imagine how much we can do with all this if we keep it and try to fix the homelessness? Uh, am I saying something that's a little bit way out and uh, I feel it is our responsibility that we should put pressure on our government and keep the money at home and spend it to the people who need it. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. First of all, I mean, we didn't talk about how homelessness came to be this way, but it was because the federal government stopped funding HUD, you know, which is Housing and Urban Development, U.S., that we ended up having homelessness. And it's very hard for states and municipalities to come up with the sufficient resources to invest in the building of affordable housing because we keep using you know, the profit mo model to build housing and it doesn't work. The government was spending millions of dollars building public housing. We have not built public housing since 1980. Instead, we have a few vouchers and lots of people who are homeless directly resulted from it. I don't think we can fix this. It would be a much tougher problem to solve at the state level without the support of the federal government. So I think this may be a related question from the chat, which is what is our biggest obstacle in Los Angeles to enacting housing first and what strategies have worked for you in the past in getting New York and other places to adopt it? I think that um, what is missing in Los Angeles is a coherent and agreed upon plan that would go not only to LA city, but to LA County, you know, so because uh, people move around and you're going to need housing in all the different counties. But I think if we started with that kind of a united vision of what we're all about, that would be terrific. We're not even there yet. I mean, the recent administration was actually advocating to back off housing first and they wanted to go to the shelter system. The United States Interagency Council on Homelessness has a policy brief that talks about housing fourth. They want trauma-informed care and sobriety and employment before housing. How are you supposed to get care and employment before, you know, you know it, it, but I'm just bringing that out as an example of, you know, that's not, being on the same page. What we need here is to be on the same page. And the resources in this state are more than I've seen in many other states. The generosity of the legislature, you know, reflected in the populace, but the money is being distributed for many constituents and, and stakeholders that aren't all pulling in the same direction. Thank you. Are there any uh, final questions for Dr. Tsimbaras, before we move on. Yes, um, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, I'm, I guess my unfamiliarity with, with you know, your concept, I guess I wanted to know, are you referring to something that's on the level of public policy versus a community program? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because this Housing First can be a program that serves 30 or 50 people in a community that's run by a local NGO, or it could be like it is, you know, two days ago in Ireland, they uh, not surprisingly adopted a national housing first approach. So the, uh, so that, you know, it can be, and, and for Hot Vash, we have a housing first approach in our VA system. Now, you know, veterans go right to the VA, they get a voucher and services. So you can implement it as a program model in a small NGO, in a large scale citywide, or you can do it national policy. 
you know, it all depends on the resources and the range and the problem you're trying to address. Yeah, and I saw Reverend Stephanie Yeager had a question as well. Yeah, I just wanted to lift up. Um, thank you so much for 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 laying this housing first model out again for us so clearly. It's been around, as you said, for a long time, and we've struggled in LA to implement it really effectively. Um, and I think when we look at what are some of the challenges that um, we have, it really is. is uh, I I want to express my concern and and caution everyone that. Um, who is in leadership next, whoever is next as mayor, um, will have a tremendous amount of power um, for directing whether or not we resume or even deepen our commitment mm -hmm. to um, this housing first model. I mean, Garcetti is imperfect, but, but, but at least his articulated commitment is to uh, permanent, building permanent supportive housing. And at my concern as I follow other candidates for for mayor and, and city council, um, the the shift is to abandon permanent supportive housing and move towards you know the shelter model um, because it, it it is perceived as faster, cheaper, and so on. And it's it's not. I mean, I appreciated you saying we know what the solution is. We know it's permanent supportive housing. Yeah. So how can we make that happen? And I I just want to throw out one other thing that I think is a really big issue in LA, and that is um, the challenges that we have, particularly in the valley, around zoning. And if we really want to tackle the issue of, of um, enhancing the building of permanent supportive housing, I think as community groups, we really need to articulate an organized plan for, um, for relaxing um, the zoning laws in our mm -hmm. area. Um, it, it's in, and make sure that we have city council representation mm -hmm. that recognizes that that this kind of exclusionary zoning is is one of the main hurdles that were that, right. that is in place here locally, particularly in the valley. Sorry, right. that wasn't a question, but I just wanted to lift up no, no, it's a, it's, local concern. It's a very important. May, may I address that for a moment? Because uh, I think that uh, we have a difference of opinion about uh, the solution being permanent supportive housing. I absolutely do not think that permanent supportive housing is the solution, unless you're talking about having access to uh, subsidies so that the person's housing is permanent. But this idea of siting a building with 30 units or 50 units or 100 units, and all the people who are homeless go in there, their service is on site, that's what I think of as permanent supportive housing. We have been doing this model even longer than we've been doing housing first. It's gotten us nowhere. It's gotten us a few units here and a few units there. The places that have taken homelessness down significantly are the ones that used mixed income models where you are just building affordable housing. First of all, it's twice as cheap, twice as fast. It has no zoning restrictions because it's just housing. It's not special needs housing. And it also has the beauty of an integrated model where people of all persuasions, all ethnicities, all talents and, and uh, ages live together so that eliminates the us and themness of like, oh, this is this building for these people, which the community doesn't want and fights you with. Also, we just have never gone to scale fast enough in this permanent supportive housing. There's a third problem with permanent supportive housing, which is in a very short time, people don't need the services that they're living in, but they can't afford to move out because it's project based. And so they don't own the voucher. It's not portable. The voucher goes with the landlord of that building. It's not as empowering to a person to if they have a relationship or they want to move to another city, they could take that voucher and go. They have a life still that has a rent subsidy attached to it, as opposed to a building with a room that has their name on it. Thank you. I want to bring one more question from the chat and then we're then we do have to move on because we're running out of time. But uh, the question from the chat is, We've had a united plan through Home for Good and the city and county coordinated plan several years ago, prioritizing housing first. But with the recent rise in homelessness, that unity has disintegrated. Do you have thoughts on how we get back to a unified approach when elected officials are preoccupied with appeasing community groups to create Band-Aid solutions? Yeah. You know, you need uh, politicians with spine, you know, like, <laughs> like it, 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 you can't be blowing in the wind every time there's a crisis. This happens all the time with housing first programs. You know, it's a very risky program. You're bringing in people 
that have severe addictions on to mental illness into an apartment. And so you've committed to housing these, you know, it's a commitment. And the first time someone that falls asleep with a cigarette and sets fire to an apartment, it's like, that's it. Are we going to throw out the, the thing? Actually, when you have a crisis is exactly the moment where you recommit to your values and stay the course, because that's the only way you're going to get to the destination rather than change directions every time something happens chasing headlines. All of the successful programs have a three-year, a five-year, a 10-year approach, and they stick with it. And when you deviate, you know, just to please public opinion or pressure, that's just taking you back, lost time and lost money invested in other directions. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, this entire presentation, which I think I can speak for everybody to say was very informative. Um, as we move forward, and thank you for taking the time, I want to say, mm -hmm. to be here with us tonight. That was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. As, as we move forward now in, in our remaining 15 to 20 minutes here, I do want to lift up some very specific and immediate solutions because I think, you know, as, as Dr. Simbaris has said, we, we have to have this unified vision towards housing first. And as we move there, we have particular um, campaigns and direct uh, mutual aid that we are working on. So I wanna lift up some people to speak about those things now, just you know, very briefly, I'm gonna ask each of the speakers to stay to, to three to five minutes because we have a few things we want to put before people of ways you can plug in right now um, to the work that we're doing and to building, building the political will that we need to really, to really make changes. So first, if I could ask Reverend Ray, Ray, to talk again for just a few minutes about the, the current campaign to cancel rent and mortgages. Yeah, happy to. Thanks again, everybody. It's, um, and thank you so much, Dr. Sambedas. I was so Im just impressed by your presentation and convinced. And so I'm looking forward to reading more of your work and following you um, in your research. Um, uh, so the cancel rent, cancel mortgage campaign um, is um, one of the most exciting ways that I think that we are able to really combat homelessness um, and uh, really be changing our systems um, that uh, of how we started and got here. <laughs> so um, primarily, just like Dr. Sambera said, um, it's the will of the people. Um, if we want it to happen, it can happen. Um, we have the funds. We've known that we have been able to bail out um, the largest airlines here in the US with billions of dollars. Um, and yet we didn't see that money really uh, contribute to keeping people safe and protected from COVID. Um, and so we have the money and we are expecting, we know that there's federal dollars right now coming um, back to the states. Um, and so where's that money gonna go? And so we are saying in this moment, we're meeting with um, county supervisors and with city council members of Los Angeles to say, we need a cancel rent, cancel mortgage policy and we need it pass now. And we're hoping it, to see it pass in January. So I'd really like to encourage everybody to be paying attention. Um, I work uh, with Healthy LA to get this word out. And so I'm sure you all will be hearing about it since you all are members as well. Um, the, the goal of the policy and platform um, is to exactly what it sounds like, which is to provide um, full debt relief of past rent that was due and also um, rent that will be due in the future until the end of the pandemic. Um, and that it would be paid, um, that it would go uh, directly to uh, paying off the debts um, of those who are impacted by COVID and pay off uh, and go to the landlord um, and be able to also help pay off debts of homeowners as well. Um, so I think I'll just stop there. Um, I'm not sure what else I can say. Um, there's a lot of information that I could go into details of. So I saw that the platform was dropped. Um, we did have a um, teach-in last week uh, so you can watch that Zoom and learn more. Um, Council Member Bonin and uh, Council Member Nithya Raman both spoke. And there's also an LA Times op-ed too um, of their reasoning, so yeah. Thank you, thank you. And I think that is an important systemic solution. And um, I now want to ask Kim Olson of West Valley Homes Yes and West Valley People's Alliance to speak about our work specifically on addressing sweeps because we heard those stories about how destructive sweeps are in the current moment and so about our work towards um, uh, addressing sweeps and uh, eviction defense. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, such a strong endorsement of the housing first model. That was an incredible presentation. 
Um, <clears throat> so until we get to that point, until we house everybody, we need to deal with what's happening now. And um, <clears throat> LaDonna has been through this too many times. There is no good sweep. There is no excuse to, for this inhumane treatment, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Um, the first time I saw them sweep at Nun Van Nuys was um, three days before the, the hottest day on record. That weekend held a record for the most deaths among the unhoused in Los Angeles. <clears throat> they took people's shade covering, they took their water. They took the things that people need to survive. There is no excuse for treating human beings this way. I would encourage everyone to sign up for our rapid response where we go out, we monitor these sweeps. Um, we get involved in activism to try and prevent some of these sweeps. Um, I was out today and a mentally ill woman was going to be taken by the LAPD and Department of Mental Health against her will. Um, <clears throat> sometimes all they need is someone to stand up and say, you know what, you really shouldn't do this. I am asking you not to do this. And for our rapid response, we will train you, we will bring you out, we will teach you how to monitor, we will teach you how to document these abuses so that in the future, we can protect more people. And occasionally we win. We've stopped a lot of sweeps. There have been several since the pandemic started that we have been able to stop. And um, we're gonna keep fighting it and we're gonna keep doing that. So for anyone who wants to join our rapid response, we're also um, coming out in support of evictions. We're coming out to monitor and document and to, um, to help people who have been illegally locked out we will also dial you into other local actions. I would encourage everybody. We're gonna see possibly 375,000 evictions in the next few months, in the next year, unless something changes. So please do sign up. Please get involved in all the activism around cancel rent. It is maybe the most important thing uh, for all of us right now. If you care about human rights and human dignity, it is, it is the most important thing. Then we're going to see the streets flooded if we don't do something. <clears throat> um, really quickly, because I know we're short on time, um, I wanted to talk about, in terms of basic human dignity, we have a lot of folks who have not had a legal place to use the bathroom since this pandemic started. Imagine using the bathroom is a, is a criminal offense. So that's what we're looking at. CD12 has provided no porta potties to our unhoused folks. That's criminal. That's what's criminal. Using the bathroom should not be a crime. Call John Lee's office, get involved with uh, People's Alliance. We need to confront them head on. They need to know that people care about the unhoused in our community and that we won't accept this. We absolutely will not. I would like to direct you to the services, not sweeps demands. Um, I think, yep. <laughs> Hana, you're so good. She posted it right away. Thank you. Um, okay. To be clear, we think that trash should be picked up. Most of our in-house neighbors want the trash picked up. If you did not have a trash can, where would your garbage go? Right? We want trash pickup. We want to increase those services. We want to do it in a dignified and humane way. <clears throat> we want there to be basic human dignity, access to showers, access to bathrooms, access to harm reduction. I'm not sure that a lot of people in this uh, meeting know, but we have had over a dozen deaths at one of our project room key locations. And the city has not provided any harm reduction there. We need Narcan training. Anybody who wants to be involved in getting Narcan out and getting Narcan training, let us know. Reach out, sign up for People's Alliance. We would love to bring you in. <clears throat> um, we also need to be humane in this hostile architecture. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but people placing boulders and bricks, dropping things where you pointed spikes so that unhoused folks cannot relax so that they cannot lay down, so that they cannot sleep. 
we need to rescind 4118 and 5611. They are incredibly expensive and they're just strictly to criminalize our unhoused folks. We need to pull that back. We need to take that away from them. <clears throat> we need to support any budget proposals that give bathrooms, that allow our unhoused neighbors to live with dignity. The same kind of dignity that you would demand for yourself. There is no excuse for us not to stand up for this. Um, and then number three, implementing the guiding principles and practices for local responses to unsheltered homelessness across all areas and departments of the city, particularly sanitation. I would encourage anyone who has even a small interest, come out with us, come out and monitor a sweep, come out and see how sanitation and the police department and LASA, how they treat our unhoused neighbors. It is quite an awakening. Um, we also do outreach on Sundays and I think actually Isabel is gonna talk about that. So if anyone has any questions, let me know, but I think I covered it, Anna. That's perfect, thank you, Kim. And in fact, you, you took my next bit. And so we're gonna pass it over to Isabel to talk about our outreach and about what you can do right now to support it. Thank you, thank you, Kim. Um, and thanks for letting me be the um, speaker for this, uh, for on behalf of the amazing group of folks that, that does outreach. Uh, every Sunday um, with uh, West Valley People's Alliance and West Valley Homes Yes. We do it every um, Sunday at 1 p.m. at Fish Food Pantry, which Kim is the queen and heralding leader of. Um, as Sam mentioned, we want to like aim for goals that are beyond, you know, more Band-Aid solutions like tents and meals, but the reality is that we have neighbors that need this right now. Um, and so that, that an opportunity in the immediate to show dignity and just get to know um, neighbors in your community. Um, it, I started doing this in about August and it is as has been as beneficial for me it has been a gift to me to get to know um, these folks and um, really know uh, my community. Um, so we are doing them this weekly, but we also have a special um, outreach on uh, uh, Christmas Eve day at 1 p.m. And leading up to that, we're doing um, a donation drive for things like jackets, coats, blankets, tarps, tents. We also need folks to volunteer um, to write cards, uh, if anyone would be interested in doing that. Um, and then on the actual day, um, we will be distributing those goods alongside um, meals. If you would like to volunteer, um, perhaps know someone that may be able to volunteer and make meals um, or buy pre-made meals from a grocery store, any little bit counts, even up to five meals makes a difference. Um, so I'm going to post those links. Oh my goodness, I just deleted it. Um, it's bit.ly West Valley holiday. That is the form to sign up and has all the information on like what kind of donations we're looking for and the times and everything. And then if you have any specific questions, you are, can reach out to me. Um, and that's my email in the chat. Um, so thanks so much. And thank you for all the amazing speakers and um, big shout out to Polar too, who really like pulled all the strings to put this on. Um, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank, no, thank you. Thank you for um, talking about that. And I encourage everyone, if you are able to make donations, particularly for the holiday outreach to try to um, make that happen, please, please go to that link. And also, we're, uh, we're going to offer a couple other things you can do right now. But before we do, I also just wanted to say thank you to uh, Jeremy Saray, who's here from Assemblymember Jesse Gabriel's office. And we really appreciate um, the, the Assemblymember sending somebody to our event. So thank you. Um, next, if uh, Anna Cardenas is here from Fish Food Pantry and Congregational Church of Chatsworth. I would uh, love to ask you to speak for just a few minutes about what Fish does. Fish is the food pantry that all of our outreach is is run out of, and we are fundraising for them tonight. And so, Kim, is is Anna here, or are you talking? Anna's here, I think. Uh, okay, I'm here. Yay, um, <laughs> Anna, could you talk about Fish for just a few minutes? Well, um, if you guys are not familiar with FISH. FISH has been around in the Chatsworth community for uh, 50 years. We have been providing food and other assistance to our neighbors in need um, 
all that time. But now, obviously, with COVID-19, everything increased. Um, our uh, recipients uh, increased 500%. Uh, we only used to be open on Saturdays and um, serve about 300, about 250 to 300 people a week. We are now serving over 1,000 a week. Um, plus, we, as uh, you guys have mentioned, we are the hub for the outreach that um, is going out every Sunday uh, to make sure that we reach our unhoused neighbors. Um, but we also do delivery to seniors at risk that are not uh, able to come out of their home, um, disabled uh, friends and, and neighbors that also are not able to come to the food pantry to get help. Uh, but one of the things that makes us unique and that we, we hope we are really doing a service to our, um, our friends and neighbors that are, that are experiencing homelessness right now is that when they come to fish for a box of food, as you've seen in many of these drive-through um, food drives that they get a box of food, everyone gets the same box of food. At fish, we take into consideration what your situation is. So one of the questions we ask, do you have refrigeration? Do you have cooking facilities? If they say, well, I only have a small cooler, I have a one burner stove, we make sure that that box of food is um, customized for whatever their needs are. So anyone, any one of our, of our um, unhoused neighbors can come to fish uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, now during the pandemic, and get the food that they need along with hygiene kits, um, hygiene products if they need uh, toilet paper, paper towels, or shampoo. We try to make sure that they have what they need to survive out there in terms of food and basic um, uh, needs, hygiene needs. Um, that This is just the one step that we can at FISH be able to, to make an impact um, while they are, as we heard today, going through so much um, with sweeps, with the uncertainty of where they're going to spend the night and, and not be able to be in a secure place, at the very least, we can provide them the food that they need to nourish their bodies um, to keep going. Um, so uh, I, I'm having trouble sharing the, uh, the document, if uh, Pilar can do that for me or Kim, um, but we are fundraising right now because like many organizations, uh, we've suffered through this uh, COVID-19 crisis in terms of a lack of funds to be able to um, really promote our program and do more for the people that we serve in need. And um, our fundraising information, again, I'm having trouble with this phone. There we go. Um, you can learn more information about us. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and contact us. Uh, come come visit us. We are here every single day. There's something happening at FISH every single day. Uh, we welcome people to get involved in the work that we do. Uh, we are here to help all of you as well um, by providing the food that um, that our, our community needs. And right now, it's not just, you know, people who are unhoused. We, we are helping so many families that never in their life thought that they would have to ask anyone to provide food for their families. But this is what we do. This is, you know, this is our calling. This is what our ministry is. And we're here to help you. And uh, we hope that those of you who can contribute or spread the word about fish, do so, so that we can continue the work that we're doing and be able to reach even more people. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And I really encourage people um, in these next couple of minutes, and I know we have just crossed eight o'clock and, and we are, we are mindful of your time and we're going to close things out right now here. But um, I do want to just say, please be generous. Please donate to fish. Please uh, go again. If somebody could post again, Isabel's link to the, for what we need for the holiday outreach drive, please consider bringing things by for that outreach drive as well. We appreciate your contributions. So for just our last uh, minute here, a couple minutes, I would like to go to Pilar, who really is the driving force behind kind of everything we do here with West Valley Homes Yes and the uh, West Valley People's Alliance. And, and Pilar will just give you a little bit of information on how you can join us. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. And, and she has more about how you can join us going forward in this work. Um, so thank you everybody for being here tonight, for being a part of this conversation. And I just want to um, take one second to kind of acknowledge where we've come um, for people who know West Valley Homes Yes. 
Um, we were a tiny little baby starting organization just over a year ago. And um, West Valley People's Alliance is even more of a baby. We just <laughs> launched in, in June. Um, and it's, it's really, you know, at the end of the year, you always kind of take account of, of what you've done in that year. And um, many people who have made our amazing work happen are here on this call today. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who has really made a difference in the West Valley. Um, and I'm getting all like sensitive about it. Um, <laughs> I just think it's wonderful and amazing and it makes me so happy. Um, so we hope that you will join this movement and you will get involved with us um, because the more we build, the louder our voices for these kinds of solutions, the stronger we are in the West Valley, the more we can win housing justice, racial justice, environmental justice, all the, the issues that we are working on um, in the West Valley in our community. Um, and you know, this is an area where we really have so much opportunity to build and grow and make a difference. Um, you know, our tiny little baby organization has become a really loud voice and a strong voice in our community. And um, and there's, you know, we can only go up from here. And so the the more people who are involved, the more people who join us, please do, please click that link, sign up on our email list, tell us what you're interested in getting involved in. We have committees that work on um, housing and homelessness, racial justice, environmental justice, and we also need help around communications. There's, you know, whatever your skills are, bring them our way. We can put you to work. Um, we can, <laughs> we can use your help, and you know, you can help us build and elevate and and grow this movement. So, um, I just want to say thank you again to everyone who's been a part of it so far. Everyone who's here today all of our guests who were a part of this beautiful program um, to really elevate what connects us, how we're united, and how we can really make a difference and bring real solutions to our community. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody and Hana and Ankur for moderating. Thank you, Pilar. And yes, I will echo that. I will just say thank you, especially to all of our speakers, um, to everybody who took the time to be here to take part in this, to all of you here. Uh, please reach out to us, if, especially if you're new to this. And um, thank you. Thank you all and happy holidays. Thank you all. For these ADEMs, and then they might go, what's the ADEM?